Nowadays renowned as the father of physics, Nikola Tesla was an unsung hero for most of history. Tesla was a visionary, a genius, and a selfless inventor, was primarily focused on harnessing electricity in a way that could power the entire world and serve humankind for eternity. He pioneered alternating current which revolutionized the field of electricity and became the basis of the modern electric industry. Many groundbreaking inventions are attributed to none other than the brilliant Nikola Tesla. Throughout his career, he created pumps, turbines, speed indicators, and more. Even during his declining years, he carried on his scientific research and continued his art of innovating. Unfortunately, many of his projects stalled or remained unfinished due to a lack of consistent financial support, propaganda from rivals, prejudice, and some ill-fated life events. In today's video, we'll discuss some of Nikola Tesla's lost inventions and papers that were never released until now. Death Ray One of the most enigmatic, controversial, and sought-after of his creations was the Death Ray. Tesla's creativity never ceased to impress the masses even when he was growing senile. His father instilled a strong aversion to war in him. He worked tirelessly to find a technological solution to put an end to war. He believed war could be reduced to a mere spectacle of machines. At a press conference in 1931, Tesla declared that he was about to discover an entirely new energy source. When asked to describe the nature of the power, he responded, The idea first came upon me as a tremendous shock. I can only say at this time that it will come from an entirely new and unsuspected source. Once more, war loomed over Europe. On July 11, 1934, the New York Times front page headline read, Tesla at 78 bears new death beam. The report stated that the new technology will send concentrated beams of particles through the free air of such tremendous energy that they will bring down a fleet of 10,000 enemy airplanes at a distance of 250 miles. According to Tesla, the death beam would prevent war by providing each nation with an invisible Chinese wall. The concept sparked a great deal of debate and interest. When Tesla realized he needed money to create a prototype of his planned invention, he went to J.P. Morgan to seek financial aid, but he failed to persuade him. Tesla also made an effort to communicate directly with the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, but interest in Tesla's anti-war weapon eventually petered out when Chamberlain resigned after realizing that Hitler had outwitted him at Munich. By 1937, it was clear that war would erupt in Europe. Frustrated with his efforts to generate interest and funding for his peace beam, he sent a detailed technical letter complete with diagrams to several allied nations, including the United States, Canada, England, France, the Soviet Union, and Yugoslavia. The paper, titled New Art of Projecting Concentrated Non-Dispersive Energy Through Natural Media, provided the first technical description of a charged particle beam weapon. The unique vacuum chamber with one end open to the atmosphere distinguished Tesla's proposal from the usual run of fantasy death rays. To maintain high vacua, Tesla created a one-of-a-kind vacuum seal by directing a high-velocity air stream at the tip of his gun. A large Tesla turbine would be used to perform the necessary pumping action. The Soviet Union was the most interested in Tesla's proposal of all the countries that received it. Tesla presented a plan to the Amtorg Trading Corporation at a rumored Soviet arms front in New York City in 1937. Two years later, in 1939, one stage of the plan was tested in the Soviet Union, and Tesla received a $25,000 check. Tesla hoped that his creation would be exclusively defensive and serve as an anti-war tool. His system needed power plants along a nation's coast to scan the skies for enemy aircraft. The beam's effectiveness was limited to about 200 miles, the distance of the Earth's curvature, because it was projected in a straight line. Tesla also considered using his particle beam for peaceful purposes, including long-distance power transmission without wires. He also advanced the radical idea of creating artificial aurora borealis by heating a portion of the upper atmosphere. Whether Tesla's concept was ever seriously considered is still up for debate. Most experts today believe his theory to be unsustainable. However, his death beam is eerily similar to the charged particle beam weapon that the United States and the Soviet Union developed during the Cold War. However, Tesla's hope for a technological way to end a war still seems as remote today as it did when he first put forth the idea in the 1930s. Wireless Energy 
By the end of the 1890s, Tesla had concluded that it might be possible to transmit electrical power at high altitudes without using wires. There, the air was thinner and more conductive as a result. Upon learning of Tesla's research, Leonard E. Curtis, a friend and patent attorney, offered to locate a site and secure power for the study from the Colorado Springs-based El Paso Power Company. Colonel John Jacob Astor was the next ally to come forward. The inventor immediately made plans to relocate to Colorado and start construction on a new experimental station close to Pikes Peak after receiving $30,000 from Astor. A number of assistants who weren't fully aware of Tesla's plans joined him. When Tesla arrived in Colorado Springs in May 1899, he went to survey the land. It was in the prairie some miles away. He told the media that he planned to transmit a radio signal from Pikes Peak to Paris, but he gave no further information. Tesla would sit and take measurements amidst Colorado's own spectacular electrical displays. He soon discovered the Earth was literally alive with electrical vibrations. Tesla eventually came to believe that lightning strikes created strong waves that traveled from one side of the planet to the other. Tesla theorized that if the Earth indeed was a good conductor, he could send unrestricted and virtually lossless power to any location on the planet, but to put his theory to the test, he had to become the first man to produce electrical effects on the scale of lightning. The laboratory that protruded from the prairie floor was wired and weird, a structure with a roof that could roll back to keep it from catching fire and an 80-foot wooden tower. A 142-foot metal mast holding a gigantic copper ball was positioned above it. Technicians started putting together a vast Tesla coil specifically made to send strong electrical impulses into the earth inside the peculiar wooden structure. Each piece of apparatus was first thoroughly examined on the evening of the experiment. Then Tesla instructed his mechanic to flip the switch open for just a split second. An intriguing blue corona developed in the space around the secondary coil as it started to sparkle and crack. Tesla was content with the result and instructed his mechanic to keep the switch closed until told otherwise. Big blue electricity arcs zigzagged up and down the central coil. Over 100-foot-long man-made lightning bolts erupted from the mast atop the station. Tesla's experiment destroyed the El Paso Electric Company's dynamo, knocking out power to the entire city. The power station manager was furious and insisted that Tesla repair and cover the cost of the damage. Tesla experimented in Colorado Springs for nine months. The outcomes of his experiments are unclear, even though he kept a daily journal that was highly detailed. Did Tesla actually transmit wireless power at Pike's Peak? That is one question that has never received a conclusive response. There are some claims that he actually sent a signal several miles away that was strong enough to light up vacuum tubes planted in the ground. However, this can be attributed to Colorado Springs' conductive ground characteristics. Tesla also tried sending extra low frequency signals through the region between the Earth's surface and the ionosphere. Tesla estimated that this region's resonant frequency was around 8 Hz. This theory wasn't seriously considered until the 1950s when researchers were shocked to learn that this space's resonant frequency was in fact in the 8 Hz range. The ionosphere, an area 80 kilometers above the Earth, was the target of the third method of wireless power transmission. Again, Tesla predicted that this particular region of the atmosphere would be highly conductive, and his projections came true. He required the technical means to deliver electrical power to such a great height. Tesla discovered a repeating signal being picked up by his transmitter one evening while working in his lab. He thought he was receiving a signal from space, much to his own amazement. Tesla was widely mocked when he made this discovery, but it's possible that he was the first individual to observe radio waves coming from space. Tesla's work in Colorado Springs is still shrouded in profound mystery. His notes and comments do not clarify how he intended to transmit wireless power, but it is evident that he went back to New York City quite confident that he could succeed. Wardenclyffe Tower Tesla penned a sensational article for Century Magazine upon his return to New York from Colorado Springs. He described a method for using an antenna to capture the sun's energy in this thorough, futuristic vision. He proposed that electrical power might be used to influence the weather. He foresaw technological breakthroughs that would render war impossible and suggested a global wireless communications network. The concepts were nearly incomprehensible to most people, but Tesla was a man who could not be underestimated. 
J.P. Morgan, one of the world's most powerful men, was drawn to the article. Tesla, a frequent visitor to Morgan's home, proposed a scheme that must have sounded like science fiction back then. He suggested a world system of wireless communications to transmit telephone messages across the oceans, telecast news, music, stock market reports, personal messages, safe military communications, and even pictures to anywhere on Earth. When wireless is fully applied, the Earth will be converted into a huge brain capable of response in every one of its parts, Tesla told Morgan. Morgan made Tesla a $150,000 offer to construct a power plant and transmission tower. A more reasonable amount would have been $1 million, but Tesla made do with what he had and got to work immediately. Contrary to what he claimed to his investor, Tesla's real goal was to carry out a sizable scale test of electrical power transmission without wires. This ultimately proved to be a fatal error. Tesla purchased land on the Long Island Sound Cliffs for his new development project. The location was known as Wardenclyffe. The Wardenclyffe project was started in 1901, with the most challenging task being the construction of a massive tower that rose 187 feet in the air and supported a 55-ton steel sphere on top of it. A well-like shaft descended 120 feet into the ground beneath the tower. 16 iron pipes were drilled 300 feet to allow currents to flow through them and grab hold of the earth. It became clear that more money was desperately needed as the tower's construction slowly advanced. However, Morgan was slow to answer. Then, on December 12, 1901, word spread worldwide that Marconi had successfully signaled the letter S from Cornwall, England to Newfoundland. Unfazed by the achievement, Tesla claimed that the Italian used 17 of his patents to complete the transmission. However, Morgan started doubting Tesla. In addition to being fully functional, Marconi's system was also cost-effective. Despite Tesla's pleading, Morgan flatly refused to provide more funding. The stock market collapse and a doubling in material costs only worsened the circumstances. The project ultimately failed due to high prices combined with Tesla's inability to find enough willing investors. After some incredible electrical displays in 1905, Tesla and his team were forced to give up the project permanently. The media dubbed it Tesla's Million Dollar Folly. Humiliated and defeated, Tesla went into a total nervous breakdown. It is not a dream, he protested. It is a simple feat of scientific electrical engineering, only expensive blind, faint-hearted, doubting world. Ozone Generator After Morgan refused to further extend financial assistance to Tesla for his wireless energy project, Tesla grew agitated and desperate. Tesla's credibility had been tainted by his failed venture, and he needed to repair his image while also making money. It is absolutely imperative for me to put out something commercial without delay, he told Morgan. As a result, Tesla focused on another of his inventions, he patented the first portable ozone generator in the United States in 1896. Following Morgan's rejection, the cash-strapped scientists formed the Tesla Ozone Company and marketed his devices as a way to clean indoor air. In the late 1800s, city dwellers became increasingly concerned about the smoke evil believed to cause illness and was produced by burning excessive amounts of coal. Pollution, a term previously reserved by Noah Webster for Unclean carnlax, such as nocturnal emissions, came to mean the human contamination of air and water during this time. Urbanites had little control over the dirty air outside their doors, but they could breathe easier inside. As a matter of fact, Tesla's machines pumped poison into the rooms. Ozone in the upper atmosphere serves as an essential shield against the sun's ultraviolet light, but pumping it into your living room is detrimental to health. Today, the FDA classifies ozone as a toxic gas with no known therapeutic applications. Ozone generators are only approved for sterilizing water and equipment. Nonetheless, unscrupulous merchants promote ozone as a cancer and AIDS cure. Tesla did not mention ozone anywhere in his autobiography, My Inventions. Remote Control Boat Tesla wanted to find a unique way to show off the capabilities of his radio wireless energy transmission system. He presented the first radio-controlled vessel in the world in 1898 at an electrical exhibition in the recently completed Madison Square Garden. While everyone anticipated surprises from Tesla, few were ready for the sight of a tiny, unusual iron-hulled boat scooting across an indoor pond created especially for the display. 
According to Tesla, the boat had a borrowed mind. Tesla wrote, When first shown, it created a sensation like no other invention of mine has ever produced. Many attendees weren't sure whether to laugh or run away, as was typical of his inventions. He had cleverly thought of a way to relax the audience and invite observers to inquire about the boat. Some people believe that Tesla was mind-controlling the miniature ship during a time when only a small number of people were familiar with radio waves. In reality, he was operating a small box with control levers on the side to transmit commands to the mechanism. Tesla's US patent number 613809 describes the first device anywhere for wireless remote control. The teleautomaton, or working model, was powered by an internal battery and responded to radio signals. Tesla didn't just apply his method to boats, he broadened its practicability to all types of vehicles and mechanisms that could be activated for any reason. He imagined one operator or several operators guiding 50 or 100 machines or vessels at once using variously tuned radio transmitters and receivers. However, the inventor was enraged when a New York Times writer suggested that Tesla could make the boat submerge and carry dynamite as a weapon of war. You do not see there a wireless torpedo. You see there the first of a race of robots, mechanical men which will do the laborious work of the human race. Tesla quickly corrected the reporter. Tesla's invention was the real beginning of robotics, although he's rarely given credit for it. The inventor's electrical and mechanical engineering training combined flawlessly to create this remote-controlled boat. Unfortunately, the invention was so far ahead of its time that those who saw it failed to imagine how large it could benefit society. Flying Machine You should not be at all surprised if someday you see me fly from New York to Colorado Springs in a contrivance that will resemble a gas stove and weigh almost as much, commented Nikola Tesla in 1913. From Albert Einstein and his ill-fated wing to Thomas Edison and his box kite type rotor biplane, anyone with a bold idea produced a flying machine in the years following the Wright brothers' first flight. However, aviation history appears to have forgotten Nikola Tesla's 1921 design for a hybrid tilt-rotor tilt-wing helicopter airplane. The United States Patent and Trademark Office granted Tesla his final patent in January 1928 for a novel method of transporting bodies through the air. He described and drew an open-box-type craft with a tilting propeller and wing that could theoretically rise vertically and fly horizontally. However, he also proposed a design in which two propellers, coaxially or otherwise disposed of, would revolve in opposite directions, powered by his turbine engine. Contrary to popular belief, this was not the inspiration for vertical takeoff on landing aircraft, but it does appear that he made a few significant first claims. Earthquake Machine Tesla patented a steam-powered mechanical oscillator that vibrated at high speeds to generate electricity in 1893. Years after patenting his invention, he told reporters that he caused the ground to shake one day while attempting to tune his mechanical oscillator to the vibration of the building housing his New York City laboratory. Throughout the test, Tesla kept increasing power and heard cracking sounds. Suddenly, he recalled, all the heavy machinery in the place was flying around. I grabbed a hammer and broke the machine. The building would have been down about our ears in another few minutes. Police and ambulances arrived on the scene to investigate the commotion, but Tesla asked his assistants to remain silent and informed the police that it had to have been an earthquake. Supersonic Electric Airship Tesla had been fascinated by the idea of flight since he was a child. After Wardenclyffe's failure, he began to think more about aviation, combining his electrical and mechanical engineering knowledge. In an article published in the July 1919 issue of Reconstruction magazine, Tesla discussed his work on developing a supersonic aircraft. The aircraft, as per the scientists, would travel eight miles above the Earth's surface and generate speeds that would allow passengers to travel between New York City and London in three hours. Tesla's concept called for the aircraft to be powered by electricity transmitted wirelessly from ground-based power plants, obviating the need for aircraft to carry fuel. The power supply is virtually unlimited, as any number of power plants can be operated together, supplying energy to airships just as trains running on tracks are now supplied with electrical energy through rails or wires, Tesla said in the article. Artificial Tidal Wave The engineer and physicist believes science could be used to prevent war. 
The New York World reported in 1907 on another of Tesla's military innovations in which wireless telegraphy would trigger the detonation of high explosives at sea, resulting in colossal tidal waves capable of capsizing entire enemy fleets. The artificial tidal wave would make navies as useless as the paper boats that babies float in bathtubs, according to the newspaper, and, by its horrors, hasten the day of universal peace, foreshadowing later claims about the development of nuclear weapons. Thought Camera Tesla believed that thoughts could be photographed. Tesla told a newspaper reporter decades later that the inspiration came while he was conducting experiments in 1893. I became convinced that a definite image formed in thought must, by reflex action, produce a corresponding image on the retina, which might possibly be read by suitable apparatus. The inventor imagined reflecting an image on an artificial retina, photographing it and projecting it on a screen. If this can be done successfully, then the objects imagined by a person would be clearly reflected on the screen as they are formed, he said, and in this way, every thought of the individual could be read. Our minds would then indeed be like open books. Missing Papers Lastly, one of the more contentious issues surrounding Nikola Tesla is what happened to many of his technical and scientific papers after his death in 1943. He claimed to have perfected his so-called death beam just before his death at the height of World War II. It was natural for the FBI and other United States government agencies to be interested in any scientific ideas involving weaponry. Some feared that Tesla's papers would fall into the hands of the Axis or the Soviets. The morning after the inventor's passing, his nephew, Sava Kosanovich, hurried to the Hotel New Yorker and entered his uncle's room. Kosanovich was a rising official in Yugoslavia who was thought to have connections to the Communist Party there. When he arrived, Tesla's body had already been taken away and he suspected someone had already gone through his uncle's belongings. Technical papers and a black notebook he knew his uncle possessed with several hundred pages marked government were also missing. P. Foxworth, assistant director of the FBI office in New York, was assigned to investigate. The government, according to Foxworth, was vitally interested in preserving Tesla's papers. Representatives from the Office of Alien Property went to Tesla's room at the New Yorker Hotel two days after his death and seized all his belongings. To examine the Tesla papers held by the OAP, Dr. John G. Trump, an electrical engineer with the National Defense Research Committee of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, was contacted. After a three-day inquiry, Dr. Trump concluded, Tesla's thoughts and efforts during at least the past 15 years were primarily of a speculative, philosophical, and somewhat promotional character, often concerned with the production and wireless transmission of power, but did not include new, sound workable principles or methods for realizing such results. Immediately following World War II, there was a resurgence of interest in beam weapons. Copies of Tesla's papers on particle beam weaponry were delivered to Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. To determine the viability of Tesla's concepts, an operation named Project Nick was heavily funded and placed under the command of Brigadier General L.C. Craigie. The details of the experiments were never made public and the project was apparently abandoned, but then something strange happened. The copies of Tesla's papers vanished and no one knows what happened to them. The last of Tesla's belongings, including his papers, were returned to Sava Kosanovich in 1952 and brought to Belgrade, Yugoslavia, where a museum was erected in his honor. Western journalists and academics found it very challenging to access the Tesla archive in Yugoslavia for many years under Tito's communist regime. Even then, they were only permitted to view a limited number of papers. This was not the case for Soviet scientists who visited in delegations during the 1950s. Concerns grew when Soviet Premier Khrushchev told the Supreme Soviet in 1960 that a new and fantastic weapon was in the hatching stage. Work on beam weapons continued in the United States as well. In 1958, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency launched a top-secret project at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory called Seesaw to develop a charged particle beam weapon. The project was forsaken after more than 10 years and $27 million. There was no knowledge of Tesla's papers among the scientists working on the project. In the late 1970s, it was rumored that the Soviet Union had made a significant technological advancement. According to some U.S. defense analysts, a sizable beam weapon facility was built in southern Russia, close to the Sino-Soviet border. 
President Ronald Reagan announced the Strategic Defense Initiative in 1983 in response to this technological surprise, which urged scientists to work on making nuclear weapons ineffective to ensure world peace. The program is generally regarded as a failure. Despite 50 years of research and billions of dollars in investment, there is still no practical means of defense against a nuclear missile attack. Scientists and researchers have been looking for Tesla's lost papers for a long time, but all efforts have been futile. It's possible that if Nikola Tesla had any knowledge of how to project lethal energy beams through the atmosphere precisely, he took it with him to his grave. Under the Freedom of Information Act, the FBI eventually declassified about 250 pages of Tesla-related documents in 2016. The Bureau then issued two more reports, the most recent of which was released in March 2018. Many questions, however, have yet to be resolved despite the publication of these documents. Some of Tesla's files are still missing. I should fill you in on that, I guess. Nikola Tesla was a great inventor and uh, a great, great humanitarian. Well, Tesla wanted to get into his field, which was free, if you will, energy that comes from the surroundings. He was hired by um, J.P. Morgan to work with S uh, Westinghouse and Edison companies and, and in the East Coast. And Tesla said, I've, I've got it made. I think we can now transmit electrical power through the Earth, through the ionosphere, without any wires or, or telephone poles. If you gave a device, like a free energy device, a generator that would, would uh, service all their needs in their home for free, they could then bring out their creative talents, which they were born with and have been suppressed because they've had to toil for a living. They could be tremendous artists beyond, beyond our dreams, tremendous engineers beyond our dreams. J.P. Morgan was not buying it. He said, no, we're going to have to tear this stuff down. So Tesla kind of pulled back into himself and decided, you know, well, I guess it's not time for this. And, well, at, at that time, he was living in the New Yorker Hotel, actually, in New York. And um, there was a fellow by the name of Otis Carr who he's going to school and to supplement his, his income, he worked as a clerk in this hotel. And uh, Tesla and him became acquainted and Carr was a sponge. He loved science in every way, shape or form, but he was a natural science. He believed in the same thing Tesla did, that there, there's no limits to natural science and everything should be on a simple level. Tesla said, they're, they're not interested in my, my time. I want you to take everything I can teach you and go in your time and see if they'll listen to you. And if you don't make it, you're going to have to pass it on because at the rate we're going, we're on a self-destructive course. Carr said, I will, I will. And he, he got his own lab started and, and started uh, uh, really getting into a lot of free energy devices and building them. So he built a spaceship? Mm -hmm. He's building small spaceships then. And he had different sizes, different models. So tell us how you met Otis Carr and how you began working with these flying saucers. There's a company, Advance Kinetics, in Costa Mesa. That's where we were living, in Costa Mesa, California. And they're looking for a research and development laboratory technician. They gave me a job, they put me in the research lab, and I was inventing ideas all day long. I just loved it because I, I like to invent simple ways of doing hard things. And was, was Otis Carr working there too? No. I told some friends about, about, about this and what I was doing and he said, well, come to our group. We've got a group here called Understanding. It was created by a, a gentleman by the name of Daniel Fry in California. We could talk about things that were unlimited, not limited. I said, my mission is to see that we have habitation and transportation in, in one vehicle. And he said, well, you, you sound like a guy that's back east getting in trouble right now. His name is Otis Carr. And he put in a patent for a levitation device, and they, they wouldn't give him the patent. They had to, he said, you've got to pull that levitation out and anchor it on the ground, and we'll give you a patent on an amusement device. You cannot use levitation. They brought him out to California. They said, here's your lab. They, it was all built. It had living quarters. It had, uh, you know, machine shops. It had. That's where you did most of your work, I imagine. And this is where you guys the... worked on the spaceship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long did it take to develop this crap? Day and night, 24-7, we were building these small prototypes. And they would range anywhere from, oh, 12 inches to 3 feet to 6 feet, to, you know, in, in size. And they actually flew. They actually levitated. Oh, yeah. Oh, and sure. What was the source of the power? Well, it was magnetic in nature. And, uh, and you were actually here. building these for people to sit in. I mean, not just models. These were, these were prototypes just to prove uh, what we wanted and then graduate up to where 
human habitation could could get on board and, and, and operate them. If you could explain to us very simply how this device, how these craft work. In those days, yeah. we had counter-rotating wheels, one going clockwise and another going counterclockwise. We had a capacitor, we had small magnets, and um, we had what's called a U-tron. It was a double tetrahedron. That's two ice cream cones put with the open ends together so that you have a diamond shape and we had 12 of them around the periphery of the craft. And we had magnets, horseshoe magnets, 12 of those around the craft. So when you started rotating and counter-rotating, the, as these U-trons went through the field, they would act as, as a generator and a capacitor in, in themselves, and they would generate a lot of power, not necessary electrical power, but vibrational power. When you get to the resonant frequency of your surroundings, uh, it cancels everything out. It goes to a zero point. And once you've reached zero point, then you can go anywhere you want. And you're, you're, you have your own force field around the, the craft. control its up and down and left and right movements by how fast it spins or other gyros in there? Yeah, the ones with the models we had, we had uh, remotes, you know, to, to, to operate the models. But <clears throat> when, when you get up into the larger craft, it's not necessary because everything then, as Carr was explaining, the difference between the brain and the mind is synergetic. You operate the craft like it was a friend it's, it's like it was a living thing because you connect with the craft yes and, and that's that's the only way that our particular craft would work there's a mental interface yes so it's wow. kind of like yes. the thoughts carry out a vibration as well mm -hmm. and you have to mm -hmm. go in harmony with the ship so some sort of morphogenic field was created perhaps some sort of almost yes. living field yeah, absolutely ralph have you had a chance to fly it yourself Flying is an, an antiquated word when it comes to the type of spaceships that we were operating because they don't f conventionally fly. Or they, levitate. They levitate and they teleport. They move through this thing called time and space. They actually traverse through multi-dimensions. So you created an artificial gravity field, is it safe to say? Uh, yeah, you could say that, yeah. Is this in any way related to the work of John Hutchinson and his anti-gravity experiments? Well, it's along the same lines. I know John, he's, he's an associate of our group. And as I mentioned before, there's all forms of levitation. But where ours differs from John's is that in order to operate our craft, it takes spirit, it takes, it takes a synergy. It, you have to recognize the craft as an entity of, of, of life itself. It has a consciousness, if you will, of its own. What John is doing is wonderful. I'm glad he's discovered a tremendous field of uh, levitation and, and the composition of, of metal and uh, manicular structures. Ralph, can you tell us about your experience as being the co-pilot of one of these discs? Sure. The next stage up was the 45-foot craft that was, they had already designed and built it, and uh, <clears throat> they wanted us to test it. So we got on board, and near the center of the craft was a, a giant crystal ball in a kind of a gyroscopic holder. Underneath that was a laser that came up through the bottom of this crystal. And as the light came up and dispersed around this crystal, it lit up the crystal from infrared all the way, way around to ultraviolet. Then in car said, OK, guys, <clears throat> what I want you to do is just clear your brain and use your mind. So this is an experiment. And we're going to go outside and back in through what's known as time and space. And all you have to do is concentrate on what I'm what I'm about to tell you. We're going to go down range 10 miles. And that 10 miles down range is equated to the vibratory rate of the color aquamarine. The colors just kind of dissolved and started turning into this brilliant aquamarine. And it lit up the whole ship. And then he said, OK, that's it, boys. Get out of the craft, and we're going to debriefing. 
And we looked at each other like, oh, I don't think it worked. We didn't, you know, we didn't go anywhere. We didn't do anything. And we said, well, it didn't work, did it? He said, why don't you guys empty your pockets? And we started pulling out sticks and stones and grass and stuff and putting them on the table. And I know we didn't have those going in. And where in the heck did this come from? And he said, well, you remember I told you about the brain has a limited capacity. It cannot believe beyond its, its jurisdiction. It doesn't want to believe anything beyond that. So you travel with your mind. And, and it will come back to you. And then all these dots will be filled in as, as your life progresses. You'll remember what you did. It was in retrospect, <clears throat> I did go back now. And I do remember going and getting out of the craft. There was three of us. We walked down this ramp. We got out and we went over to a little hillside. I can see it right now. We picked up rocks and sticks, put them in our pockets, and we got back on board. I remember it now, but I didn't remember it then. It sounds like this technology is something that we have to be spiritually advanced enough to be yes. able to use it. And Carr explained that as higher consciousness. He said, you've got to raise the consciousness. When you were operating this disc, did you notice or were you told that anything changed as far as the structure of the craft? There's a consistent expansion and contraction. It's almost, it's almost so instantaneous that it's unnoticeable. And in one of the smaller demonstrations, <clears throat> we had a, a small model. Uh, aluminum model and I could hear this hum and it was just a beautiful beautiful feeling while this thing was running and I was touching it and then it, it got it got more and more intense and then I found like it was jello and I could put my fingers on it like jello and I, I looked at the other guys and then I put my fingers inside this aluminum with my, my hand I said this is impossible when I'm doing this and I put it in in and out of the craft and Carr was over there because he said, yeah, they said, yeah, you're energy, and that's energy. And when you understand that and you, you get a harmonic with energy, you get a balance, you can do anything. There's no limit. So the next day, he had another model, and we put it up, but he was going to accelerate beyond. He says, these <clears throat> retinas are like cameras, are flashing at milliseconds. And when you flash fast enough, things seemingly disappear. So with that in mind, here's our next demonstration. So we fired this one up, and we were all watching it, and I was, I was getting ready to put my hand in it, and whew, the whole thing disappeared right in front of us. He said it's quite simple. Tesla did this all the time in his laboratory, and it's, it's uh, teleported. He said, well, where did it go? And he said, well, it might have landed on somebody's dining room table. I don't know, because I don't know yet where it went, and I don't know if it'll come back. Maybe it'll show up someday. Maybe it's gone. Maybe it's still there. But we just don't see it. So we don't see it, yeah. And we, it's out of our dimension. And he explained <clears throat> that the mind, when you get, when you tune yourself high enough and you get into the mind space instead of the brain space, instead of logic or instead of reasoning or instead of all those things, you just get up to a sense of knowing. You know who and what you are. That you're a creative, immortal, infinite being. And we all are. And he said, every, everybody on this planet is, is, are gods by comparison, and they don't know it. They're asleep. <laughs> and until they wake up, this is what our job is. We're making these toys, trying to get them to wake up, to realize there's no limits to what they can do. They don't have to live in servitude. They don't have to live in poverty. They've just been told that by people that uh, unfortunately want to control things. Carr explained to us <clears throat> that the brain that we have operates this water vessel which we live in. But the energy that inhabits the vessel is who and what we are. We are energy, we're not, we're not bodies. The energy is all magnetic in nature. It's free in nature. We're swimming in energy. Well, before we could get any further with it, we were uh, invaded, if you will, by um, people with a piece of paper that said, they were at this time closing us down. The paper read that we were attempting to overthrow the monetary system of the United States, and that could be construed as high treason, and we were shutting you down and confiscating all your equipment. Wait a minute. Didn't John Hutchison say the same thing about the Canadian government, that they confiscated his entire lab at one time? I stayed in touch with Carr as much as I could, but uh, as soon as I contacted him, I was contacted by somebody. We told you to stay away from even thinking about this. Well, what did the energy companies do to Carr? 
the uh, powers that be, uh, namely the power companies, weren't quite interested in anything that to do with Tesla or car. They didn't want this information out. It was even beyond the energy company. It was behind, it came down to, and it can be traced to this day, back to the international banking system out of England. That's where this all started, the monetary system per se. Because his inventions were so revolutionary, would it upset the whole banking system? <clears throat> Yes, it would upset everything. They had a very, very uh, earnest effort put forth to, to eliminate Carr and his, and his inventions and his ideas.